Thank you, Christopher. <clears throat> Christopher Garcia is out of Valencia County, SBDC. He does a great job with our um, Zoom webinars. So thank you, Christopher. Again, we'll, we will answer Q&A at the end of the presentation. So um, we'll, we have uh, about 30 some people sitting in, in the studio down here. So this is real exciting. So um, greetings and welcome to Los Alamos, New Mexico. Thank you for showing up to learn about intellectual property. Before we dive in to intellectual property, I plan to give you a little background of myself and my program that I run, the Technology Commercializ Commercialization Accelerator in Socorro, New Mexico at New Mexico Tech. Uh, then I will introduce our USPTO speakers from uh, Rocky Mountain office. Um, I would like to thank Sandra Jones and the New Mexico Small Business Development Center of Los Alamos for inviting us to present um, at this webinar and re to reach out to you and to teach you what re resources are available for small businesses, innovators, entrepreneurs, and residents of the state of New Mexico. So my program is called the Technology Commercialization Accelerator at New Mexico Tech. I am part of the SBDC umbrella. There are 16 SBDC offices in the state of New Mexico. They are all over the, all over the different cities. There's three special programs. Today we have Apex here and we have the Technology Commercialization Accelerator. We have another uh, program, it's called the International Business Accelerator, which is down in Santa Teresa, New Mexico. Um, so uh, the SBDC consists of 16 SBDC offices, which help people with their startup businesses, and then three special programs, which include the TCA, um, the IBA and APEX. So my office is down at New Mexico Tech. And the reason we are down at New Mexico Tech is SBDC wanted to make sure that we aligned with the school that we were down there, that we were with. And New Mexico Tech, um, um, they promote entrepreneurship. So they have registered STE squared M so that stands for science, technology, engineering, entrepreneurship, and mathematics. And so uh, this is my third year in this program. Um, we started as a program. Next year, I will be an actual center. So that's real exciting. Um, we are under the SBA uh, umbrella. SBA is at the federal level. SBDCs are at the state level. So at the... Technology Commercialization Accelerator. Oh, I, did I tell you my name's Estefanita Rawlings and I'm, I'm a native Las Vegas, New Mexican. Um, throughout my career, I've been a programmer analyst, a consultant, a data analyst. And um, I did leave New Mexico for several years and I just came back in 2020. So we started up TCA program in uh, the pandemic 2020. March of 2020. So I was working at home for two years and we finally got an office and uh, we are downtown Socorro on the main drag. So um, at the TCA, we offer no cost confidential counseling regarding intellectual property. We want you thinking about your idea, protecting your idea and monetizing your idea. Um, usually I go through this slide, and we stay, spend a lot of time on this slide, which we talk about what intellectual property is and the protection um, that you can apply for. Um, Molly and Kathleen will talk a lot about that, so I, I won't go too far into that. But the main four protections are patents, trademarks, copyright, and trade secrets. And it's so nice to have a patent attorney in the audience, so that's wonderful. Um, we talk about the road to market. Um, normally, you have an idea. You want to make sure it's feasible. Uh, doing your prior art search. You have your funding. 
Um, can you build it? You build your prototype, then can you scale it? And then you get your product, you put it on the shelf. Um, those are stages that you go through and we can help you. The reason I put this slide up is because we have resources that can help you at each stage of your process as you get to market. I also have to provide cybersecurity awareness to the residents of New Mexico. Um, I work with the New Mexico Cybersecurity of Excellence at New Mexico Tech. I also work with the Apex Accelerator. Um, and then uh, we really promote the NIST Privacy and Cybersecurity Framework. We also have a new program coming up of the uh, SBDCs, and it's called uh, North Star. And they're doing a great job, so we'll be doing more presentations on cybersecurity. Uh, we had one uh, October 26th, and we had a big turnout. So you'll see us um, coming back with more presentations on cybersecurity. The big basics we talk about at cybersecurity are to keep your software up to date, if you, good password hygiene, change your default usernames and passwords, implement multi-factor authentication, encrypt your data, use a secure search engine, and use a secure browser. I'm the only one in my office right now, but I see I'm right in the middle right there. But I have I have this huge network. Okay, I have the United States Patent and Trademark Office. I have the PTRC Resource Center. They're down in uh, New Mexico State. They help do uh, prior art searches for patents and trademarks. Um, my office is next to Nucinda in Socorro, New Mexico. They provide my office. It's a really nice office, real nice big one for me myself. <laughs> but you're all welcome to come down and visit. We have the copyright office. We have Apex Accelerator. We also work with the New Mexico Small Business Assistance Program, and that is allows our residents to be uh, connected with a scientist either at Los Alamos or Sandia, UNM, New Mexico Tech, and New Mexico State. So um, they may be able to help you test your prototype, or maybe you might need an equation that needs um, some tweaking. They can help you. Uh, that program is free. You need to sign up for it, and then they help you find a scientist that will work with you. And then uh, I work under the New Mexico Tech Office of Innovation and Commercialization. Um, my supervisor does what I do for the state. My program is statewide. And my su supervisor does what I do. I help people with their intellectual property, make sure they're following processes, um, understanding the process that needs to happen. And my boss does that for New Mexico Tech, for the students, and for the faculty there. And then uh, I'm part of the SBDCs. And then I mentioned the New Mexico Cybersecurity of Excellence. They help with a lot of our trainings on cybersecurity, which is uh, really helpful. And then the SBA. So I do have a big network, even though I am by myself, but we can get you your questions answered, get you help as you move your idea forward. We offer um, workshops and events, and they are free to the residents of New Mexico. All you have to do is sign up. Um, we offer QuickBooks, how to start up a business, e-commerce, uh, cybersecurity, intellectual property. And, uh, just go to our website at nmsbdc.org, look up the workshop and events, and you can see what classes are available. And then we do have a YouTube channel. So we do uh, put up all our recorded presentations up there. So you can go look at presentations anytime that you are awake and need, can't sleep. You can go look at some IP uh, YouTube webinars out there. So, And then also uh, Sandy's group does the counseling, but all the other 16 
uh, offices we talked about also do the counseling, so you can register for counseling. They are under the New Mexico SBDC.org. That's an old one. Uh, this is my contact information, and then I have cards. I have my meetings via Zoom. I work with you to make sure that you understand what what you have, what kind of protection you'll need, and move forward to getting that protection. Um, so um, now I would like to introduce our guest speakers from the United States Patent and Trademark Office in Rocky Mountain, um, the office, Rocky Mountain. Are you guys in Denver? They're in Denver. Okay. First, we have uh, Kathleen Hutchins. She's a primary patent examiner and outreach advisor at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. She's an experienced patent examiner in the petroleum engineering field. Uh, she's an outreach advisor providing intellectual education programs for small businesses, STEM, and collegiate level training. And her background is in aerospace engineering. And then we have Molly Beth, and she's our regional director for the Rocky Mountain Regional United States Patent and Trademark Office, also known as USPTO. Uh, she's a regional director responsible for leading the Rocky Mountain Regional Office of the USPTO. She has over 20 years of intellectual property experience. She's a registered patent attorney and admitted to multiple state bars. So there you go, Molly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what Steffi didn't tell you is that I'm actually a Lobo, so can I hear all the Lobos in the room? Um, uh, chemical engineering in the early 90s, we're not going to put it at too much more of that date, please. Um, I have a really good colorist, so um, I don't look my age, thank God. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to talk about intellectual property today. Um, which, uh, you know, when I say that to my kid, he looks at me and I think he thinks of, do you guys remember like the Charlie Brown community, the, uh, comic, the, with the teacher that goes, wah, 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 wah. that's what my kid says intellectual property is, but it's shocking. Like I'll hear him say something like, oh, that's not how you use a trademark. Um, sometimes, um, when, when we do this, so something sinks in, right. Which is what we all hope as parents. All right. So we're going to talk about that a little bit, but this is your time. Okay, I always say this at the beginning. Um, I can talk about intellectual property all day, every day, um, and I love it. Um, and you'll hear that because um, I'll tell you lots of fun stories about IP. Um, but this is your time to get your questions answered. So, right, do not hesitate to interrupt me, ask questions, um, do all of those other kinds of things because this is your time. Um, the The office pays me to do this, so I'm getting paid one way or another. Well, at least hopefully if the Senate passes the bill today, um, I'll get paid one way or another. Um, but right, that's one of the things that, um, you know, I do this all the time. So we'll, we'll get into that. Oh, it's not. Nope. Down, down. Oh, okay. All right. So that's me. Um, my last name is long and unpronounceable. That has actually helped me in court. Um, I had, I had one judge who, he actually knew me personally. So he was like, well, I can't say your last name. So he only ever called me counselor. And I was the only woman at counsel table. And I was the only person that got called counselor. So it was really cool. My client thought that was really cool. So um, sometimes there's a benefit to a long and unpronounceable name. Um, but it's actually pronounced Kachowski. So there's that. All right. Let's start about what intellectual property is. Steffi kind of told you the four tenets of intellectual property law. It's these various different umbrellas of law that we call intellectual property. Um, and there's, there's really four, I know that there are five when we talk about this. I always like to talk about them in order of cost to obtain, right? So we're going to start at the bottom um, with trade secrets because trade secrets are just something that's, that's unique about your business that you can keep confidential. That's all it is, right? It's something that gives you an edge over your competitors. There's zero cost to obtain it because it came from you, right? It's your idea. And it's something that gives you an edge over your competitors, but you have to keep it a secret. And that's kind of the rub with trade secret law. Um, you know, the, the standard is using reasonable means to protect your trade secret. 
well, what are reasonable means? Um, I will tell you what was a reasonable means for cybersecurity protection when I was going to school at the University of New Mexico is not reasonable now, right? Um, I used to write my pat. well, maybe I shouldn't admit this, but I used to write my passwords down, still do. And um, <laughs> especially now that the government makes me change it every 90 days. Um, and you have to have like the blood of your firstborn and the tear of a unicorn and all this other stuff to go with it, right? Who can remember all that? So I still write them down. Probably a bad idea, um, right? But that was, that was, everybody did that. Um, in the early 90s. So I'll just say that's the rub of trade secret. You can keep a trade secret as long as you can keep it a secret, right? Um, and uh, so the biggest like threat to your trade secrets are your own employees, right? Especially if they know everything about your business and then they decide to go walk, they still know everything. Now there are statutes and laws against taking trade secrets from your employer and using them for your own benefit, all of those other kinds of things. But, you know, you can't take someone's brain out of their head when they leave you. That is also illegal. So don't do that, right? Even if you want to. Um, so, and, and once they learn something, it's really hard to unlearn it. And I think trade secrets are really hard for small businesses too, right? As a small business or an entrepreneur, everybody that is working with you is wearing several different hats. And to be able to say to somebody, no. Like, especially like for um, a recipe or a bakery or something like that. No, you don't get access to the recipe because that's a trade secret of the company and we need to be able to protect it. That's a really hard conversation to have with someone when eight o'clock in the morning so that the recipes and, and the treats and the goodies are ready for distribution at 9 a.m. So, right, I really think like trade secrets can be a little bit difficult from an entrepreneurial or a small business standpoint. The other big part about a trade secret is that you have to know what it is. You have to be able to identify it. It can't just be everything about your business. When you go to enforce a trade secret, a court is going to look at you and go, well, what, what part of it is secret? And you can't say everything. So you have to be very clear about what the trade secret is and then also what methods of protection you're using to employ it or, or to protect it and to wrap some fences around it. One of the things that um, I always tell people, if you take nothing away from this presentation, you do need to take this. He or she who creates owns in the intellectual property world, absent an agreement to the contrary. He or she who creates owns absent an agreement to the contrary. Now we sign agreements all day, every day, um, you know, all, all of that other kind of stuff. Um, but it really, you know, comes down to who's doing the creating. And if you build a business and someone else comes in to buy you, that's going to be one of the questions they're going to ask you. They're going to be like, who created this? All right. Did you transfer the ownership through an agreement to that intellectual property? And if they didn't, it gets really sticky really fast. So. Again, he or she who creates owns absent an agreement to the contrary. All right. So we talked about trade secrets. Um, and again, you can keep it a trade secret as long as you can keep it a secret, um, which if you ask my grandmother, my grandmother's like, if you tell more than one person, it's never a secret anymore. Um, but <laughs> that, that was grandma. Um, uh, she had quite the coffee clutch. We'll just say that. Um, the next up from a cost to obtain perspective is a copyright. All right, so this is the existential portion of this conversation. I'm sure you all weren't expecting a philosophical conversation when you came in here, but we're going to have it. Copyright exists as soon as you fix your idea in a tangible medium, right? Okay, but copyright only protects the expression of the idea. It does not protect the idea itself. So if you and I are standing right next to each other at Camel Rock, and we're both taking a picture, the pictures are indistinguishable, but there are two different copyrights that are associated with that. There's Mike's and there's mine because I took a picture, he took a picture. Does anyone else ever wonder who owns the copyright when you hand your camera to somebody at a tourist attraction and go, could you take a picture of me and my family for that? And it's on your phone? Well, you think you own it, right? No. Technically, the person who took the picture for you owns it because again, going back to he or she who creates owns absent an agreement to the contrary. So 
there's a presumed license that goes along with it, a presumed transfer of ownership when they hand you back your phone. But, you know, it, it's really one of those those interesting um, perspectives, philosophical perspectives from a IP attorney's um, brain that I go, do I really own the? Can I post this? Do I have the rights to this? Uh, so you have to ask yourself those questions. Copyright protects books, music, uh, fine art, sculpture, software, um, really any idea that can be expressed. Yes, ma'am. No, not unless the, like the recipe itself, it does not protect one recipe itself, except unless you're going to print it. Right. OK, so I don't know about you, but I love to bake. Um, are you ever annoyed when you look online and they have this whole long exposition plus a how-to video about, I'm like, just get me to the recipe. Molly, right. can you, can you say the question for our online? Oh, audience? I am so sorry, Chris, but thank you. That was like the voice of God. Uh, wow. You have that lovely voice. Thank you. <laughs> Please don't give me other instructions. <laughs> um, um, cause yeah. Okay, good. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Um, yes. So the question was, can a recipe be copyrighted? One recipe? No. A collection of recipes? Yes. A collection of recipes for plus pictures. The whole reason that they do that blog that goes along with it or an instructional video is because they want to be able to claim a copyright on that particular web page, that particular blog. Right. Yeah. That could be the collect. Oh, the and the follow up question was, uh, let's say I have a non alcoholic bar line recipes, um, set of recipes. That could be a collection that could be copyrighted and filed with a cop U.S. Copyright Office. And then the follow up question to that is, individually, yes, individually, the recipes would not be covered. The collection would be covered. What do you mean by conceptual? No, it's how you write it out, right? Like it, it's it's the expression of the idea. Again, doesn't go to the idea itself, right? So I can write a book about, you know, uh, I, and we're close enough to Halloween still, but um, I can write a book about, you know, a, a boy who goes off to school that has a magic wand. Um, as long as, you know, I don't infringe J.K. Rowling's work when I'm writing it. I can own my own copyright because the copyright doesn't go to protect the idea of the story. It protects how the story is written. Does that make sense? Okay, there's, ma'am. Okay, so the question is, is there protection for overseas copycats? Through a bunch of world treaties, right? Copyright exists the moment you fix it in a tangible medium. In the United States, if you want to enforce a copyright, you have to have a copyright registration. All intellectual property rights are global, but they're territorial. Okay, so that means you can get intellectual property rights in any country. Query whether you want to in some countries. Um, you know, if they don't have judges to enforce the copyright, maybe that's not a good investment of your money, right? But in order to enforce an intellectual property right, you have to have that intellectual property right in the territory where you're enforcing. So when you're talking about overseas infringers, right, because you don't register a copyright, it, it exists. And then through the Berne Convention and a couple of other treaties, it exists in every country the moment it's fixed in a tangible medium. You can go after people in overseas markets, or if they're coming into the United States, if you have a copyright registration, you can register that both with the Customs and Border Patrol. You can also do a district court action for copyright infringement. But right when you do the Customs and Border Patrol, it has to be almost an exact copy um, for Customs and Border Patrol to do that, unless it also has a trademark that's associated with it. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, yes, sir. Okay, you and me might be of an age, so we're all good. He said he was dating himself. Okay. <laughs> so the question is, 
if um, the gentleman in the audience opens up a restaurant with an all beef, two all beef patties, pickles, special sauce, lettuce, cheese on a, oh man, like, see, now you're testing my memory. I don't remember that commercial, right? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was sung, right? So are you going to sing it too? Okay, so he's singing it. There's a fine line. So Shakespeare, I think, was wrong, right? Shakespeare said that imitation was the sincerest form of flattery. It's not. It's infringement. Um, so, right, like, if you had access to the copyrighted work and you copy a substantial portion or a substantial similarity in the mind of the consumer to that copyrighted work, you're going to be liable for infringement. Now, what is a substantial portion? Uh, if you go online and you ask, they're going to tell you there's all these bright line tests about, you know, 10 seconds of a song or, you know, 10% or whatever. There's no bright line test. So Pharrell and Robin Thicke learned that when they took six beats of a Marvin Gaye song and evoked the feel of a Marvin Gaye for Blurred Lines. Um, that was a $74 million mistake, right? So, um, uh, you know, again, there's a fine line between imitation and infringement or inspiration and infringement. And it's your duty as the person who's creating to know where that line is, to know who owns the rights that of, of whatever it is that you might be inspired by. And if you are going to create what we call a derivative work, it's your job to get kind of, or, or if you're going to use the work in something else, it's your job to get permission from the intellectual property owner. So then the question, the follow-up question is, so am I only liable in this country? Um, China's an interesting question. Can we put that to the side right now? Um, let's go with a democracy. Um, but in a democracy, right, um, especially in the EU, copyright exists the moment you fix it in a tangible medium. So to the extent that that particular song was also protected, would be protected in the EU. If Burger King EU decided to do it, to go after you because you opened it in the European Union, yeah, you'd be taking a risk. Yes, sir. Uh, Chris, I can't see the questions that are coming from online. Oh, so I was waiting for your cue. We have a question. Okay. And it's Please. a set, uh, and Burger King serves their burgers on a sesame seed bun. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, our attendee asked, if you take a photo at a at balloon fiesta of hot air balloons flying in the air above the city, can that person then sell them? Photo? Sell them. Photo? Two, two. They asked, does yes. the <laughs> owner need to grant a release? And three, they say, can I then take the photo of an individual balloon or multiple balloons and Photoshop them into other photos I have taken around the area? But the person who uh, took the photo of the balloons in the first place is the person who wants to do that? Yes. Okay, so the answer is yes. If you took the photo, you can do what you want to do with it. Um, I, I highly doubt could be interesting. I might rely on Victor for this. Do balloon owners have a copyright on their balloons? Maybe. Sometimes like Creamland Dairy in Albuquerque, New Mexico will have a Creamland Dairy balloon. Oh, okay. So uh, this is a place where they're using a combination of something that might be trademarked associated with goods and services and perhaps an artistic expression that's on the tangible medium of the, but I, I think you're, it, it might be a gray area. It might be wise if you're going to be displaying that to ask permission um, from the balloon owners. But I think there's also kind of an implied license. Everybody who flies a balloon knows that pictures are going to be taken of it. Um, so it's almost as if you are granting an implied license to take pictures um, but it could be, that could be an interesting, 
Um, actually, that would be a really interesting law school question, Chris. So um, I might use that the next time I teach copyright. Um, but anyway, going back to, um, so it is a creative original expression. It must be done by a human being for those of you in the room who are computer nerds. Um, AI does not count. And anything that is created by AI, according to the copyright, is, uh, copyright office is dedicated to the public right away. Um, okay, so that's copyright. We talked a little bit more about that. It is the life of the author plus 70 years, um, 95 years from uh, publication or 120 years from creation. If you have a question about whether or not a copyrighted work is in the public domain, it behooves you to ask an attorney. That is a best practice that is recommended by both the US Copyright Office as well as the US Patent and Trademark Office to determine the expiration of it because depending on when it was created, depending on what statute it might come under. Um, and Mickey Mouse is expiring, so I'm fully expecting that there's going to be an extension to the copyright term um, that is going to come through Congress at some point. I would really recommend that you talk with an attorney about whether or not something is in the public domain um, to determine whether or not it can be used freely. Um, I know that there's a whole bunch of information about fair use um, that's out there. If it is used for a commercial purpose, you probably should not presume that it's a fair use. Educational purposes, maybe, but um, even then that can walk some fine lines. Um, uh, if you are training an AI data set with copyrighted works, um, I do think that like op uh, open AI is going to, they're in the middle of a lawsuit right now um, about uh, the the training database that they use because they basically just scrubbed the internet um, and they pulled in a whole bunch of stuff that didn't belong to them in order to train their data set. So, ma'am, you had another question. Okay, so the question is, if somebody copied artwork and the artwork has a copyright registration. Okay. Um, so if somebody copies artwork and then sells it on Timu, um, it, yeah, I, if you want, again, if you want to enforce it in the United States, you have to have a U.S. copyright registration. Okay. So if you don't have one of those, it behooves you to go get it. Um, uh, you, there, there's different timeframes of uh, the US copyright says a best practice. Copyright office says a best practice is to get the copyright registration before infringement happens or before publication, but you also have a period of four months. Um, so, uh, you know, look at whether or not you can get the copyright registration. If they are selling and you can show that Timu is selling into the United States, and I know that they are because they pop up on my Facebook feed every single day, um, right? And if they have like a server in the United States, um, almost every e-commerce platform has a takedown notice and that would be, or a takedown procedure. That would probably be your first line of defense. You would merely provide the US copyright registration to the, the e-commerce platform. And I'm speaking generally about all of them right now, not just Timu, because um, I don't want to pick on any one person, although I will later, um, right? But so, right? Yeah. It would use the takedown procedure as much as you possibly can. That does become a, a game of whack-a-mole sometimes. So, um, you know, one of the other things that is a best practice, if you are selling artwork online, um, it watermark it in some way so that, you know, then when you file your copyright registration with the Customs and Border Patrol, they you can show them where the watermark is. You can show them how to recognize the water watermark and they will confiscate the goods at all of the ports of entry in the United States, which I believe is like 380. So, right, um, it, it CBP is bar none, one of the best um, lines of defense for intellectual property owners in the United States. Um, so definitely, definitely look into that. The other thing that you can do is if you can get jurisdiction over the e-commerce platform in the United States, and I say if, right, there's there's a lot of different things that go into jurisdiction. Best practice would be to consult an attorney on whether or not it can be, um, you know, taken out of the goods, uh, the, the stream of commerce. 
but um, yeah, that it'll be a little bit of an expensive proposition on that front. Yes, sir. No. <laughs> so, okay. So I'll, I'll use Ansel Adams just because I happen to love that series of, of the mountains, right? So if, if Ansel Adams, oh, the question. Okay. Um, so the question is, and I'll do it in, in the answer as well. So if Ansel Adams stood at the bottom of, well, give me one of the more famous Yosemite, right? So he stands at the bottom of Yosemite and I decide I want to recreate that photo 50 years later, right? Or however many hundreds of years later. Don't, let's not bother with the details, but right, Ansel Adams did it, published it as part of his mountains, right? And has a copyright registration on the mountains collection. Most photographers, given the fact that they take thousands of photos, don't usually copyright every single one because it is a fee to, to the U.S. Copyright Office. So they'll actually copyright collections. Okay. So, um, but I decide I want to go recreate Ansel Adams' photo and then I want to go sell. But I actually don't just take a picture of his or I don't just take his and sell it but I go recreate the picture, that's fine. It's not an infringement. That would be where you're, that's, that's the inspiration part, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So the, the question is, could an artist, right, um, trademark their name or maybe, or their signature or something along those lines um, that goes on the artwork and then you have a trademark as well as a copyright. When you're dealing in that world, yeah, best practices to use as many overlapping forms of intellectual property as you possibly can. Um, whether or not you can get a, a trademark on that will, cover that in a minute um, because right trademarks don't exist on their own. Brands don't exist apart from the goods and services to which they're connected, right? It's one of the reasons why you can have Delta Airlines and Delta faucets. When you get on an airplane, no one is confused that you are going to get a faucet, right? You know you're getting on an airplane, um, right? And so goods and services and the marks and the brands that are used with them are always tied together. Um, if I say to you, the, and we're at a football, college football game, who am I talking about? The Ohio State, which is why we granted them a trademark on the in association with collegiate athletic apparel of in, in that goods and services. It does not exist apart from collegiate apparel. Right. So that's that's one of those things I think that people misunderstand a little bit about trademarks. But we'll get to that in just a second. So copyright, we covered um, infringement is substantial similarity. Again, there's no bright line test. Um, so please don't believe everything the Internet tells you on that. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about copyright when we get to computer programs in another minute. The next up from a cost perspective, and I believe copyright is. $75, $75, $45, $45. It's $45 per registration. So, um, and the Copyright Office has some great handouts on how to fill out the forms, but they also have an assistance center that is absolutely fantastic. So if you need to, you can fill out the forms and they'll walk you through everything that needs to be done there. Um, uh, when it comes to graphic images and you're on your web page, um, it is, especially if you have a web page that you think, um, and especially in the world of artwork, if you're going to be displaying your artwork on the page, it behooves you to get some copyright registrations on that page um, and that design. All right, next up is trademarks. Um, this is $245 per mark per class of goods and services. 
And we will talk about that in a minute. Um, so that's, you know, a little bit more of a step up in terms of protection, but this protects a word, a logo, a slogan. If um, any, or it can protect, it can be anything that acts as a source identifier, okay? As the identification of the source of those goods and services. For the ladies in the room, if you get a Robin's Egg blue box at Christmas time, how excited are you? Super excited, right? Because you know it's coming from Tiffany's. Yes, right? I, me too, hon. Um, so, right, like it, it's, it's one of those things, it can be anything. It can be a color. If you're out in a field and you see a bright green and yellow tractor, whose is that? It's John Deere, right? Um, if a brown and yellow truck pulls up to your house, what is happening? It's UPS. You're getting, you're getting a, right, you're getting a package. Um, so again, you, you need to think of a trademark as an identification of the source of goods and services. Um, and again, it could be anything, right? Um, the standard for uh, registration, also the standard for infringement, is substantial confusion or likelihood of confusion of the consumer, right? So when we're registering a trademark to an, a, to a business owner or a, a person, we look at, is this number one functioning as an identification of the source of goods and services? So when Lizzo filed her trademark for 100% that bad B, we denied her because we felt and we were able to show to Lizzo's attorney that that phrase was in the popular lexicon and it was not serving as an identification of Lizzo. So she ultimately won because she appealed us, but Taylor Swift didn't, she didn't get shaken off. So anyway, um, <laughs> we, we won't talk about my um, football loves right now, but um, a, a trademark can be um, a, anything as long as it's used as a source identifier. It must be used in interstate commerce though. Okay, it cannot, if, if you have, and perhaps in the state that I come from, there is a business that is only legal within state lines um, and you can't sell across state lines. Okay, they can't get a federal trademark registration. It has to be able to be used in interstate commerce in order to get a federal trademark registration. Now they can get a state trademark registration and they can use something that's called common law right or rely on something that's called common law rights. Um, common law rights are when you start using a mark in connection with goods and services, you start gaining rights um, in that mark as long as you're using it appropriately and as long as you're putting people on notice that you are using it as a mark. And then you'll get a certain amount of protection, usually limited to geographic scope and a class of customers that you've been able to reach. So if you are starting out small and you've got something that you're selling at a farmer's market or another artisan fair, do you need a federal trademark registration right away? No, you can rely on some common law rights, but know that those are going to be limited. And if you start selling over state lines, it really does behoove you. And there are a lot of advantages to federal trademark registration including the notion that you can file that federal trade, register that tra federal trademark registration with CBP, and they will again, keep goods from being imported into the United States. Your federal trademark registration also acts as kind of a platform for you to be able to file overseas um, in a way more organized, I'll use that word, organized manner than just filing in every single country. Because remember, like I said, intellectual property is global. You can get it in every single country in the world. It is territorial. If you want to be able to enforce a, a particular intellectual property right in a country, you must absolutely have an intellectual property right in that country, including in Canada. Like, I mean, the Canadians are usually really nice, but um, that's their reputation that they will not enforce a US trademark in Canada. And, and we will not enforce a Canadian trademark in the US. What we would enforce is we would stop goods from being imported at the border um, if you go through CBP from Canada using a US trademark registration. 
but you couldn't use a you couldn't register a Canadian trademark registration with CBP and have them enforce it. Does that make sense to everybody? I'm getting nods. Okay, good. Oh, are there questions online, Chris? Yes, we have nine. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> So an anonymous attendee asks, kind of silly, but if I download a photo of a politician from Facebook, then manipulate the photo uh, into a cartoon with some changes, can that new photo then be used in a paid political ad? Oh. That's a really interesting question. Another law school exam question, quite frankly. Um, and, and I think actually it would be best in that situation because there might also be some, well, a lot of it would depend on the right of publicity of this and, and the state where the person who's creating the, um, character, I'll use that word of, of the politician based on a photo. Um, there was an interesting case and I would tell them to consult the one of, um, there was a, a case involving one of the more famous photos of President Obama, um, and I'm not remembering the case name now, but if they get in touch with me, I'll definitely provide them that case. But that one would be worth talking to an attorney about and working through. Perfect. Thank you. Our next okay. question from Nicole. Speaking of people infringing on artwork, I know an artist who has had his artwork used for clothing and prints that he did not create nor approve but does not seem to have any recourse to stop them from doing so. Our company is starting to do scarves and such as, uh, as well with our artists and want to try to keep this from happening to us. Any suggestions? So suggestions on that front, um, definitely, you know, file. Uh, designs are the subject of, of copyright. You can file a copyright registration um, on those designs if you so desire. Um, and that would give you the ability to sue and send cease and desist letters um, to people who might be taking those designs. Um, I, I also find this really interesting. If if the person is also Native American, there are some extra laws that apply to Native American art. So that might be worthwhile consulting with an attorney as well, um, just in terms of the way that they can uh, go forward. But that is definitely one suggestion. If it's a pattern that they use over and over and over again, um, there, you know, it may be that if that becomes associated with that particular business and only that particular business, trademark might be available because, right, you can get a logo as a trademark. So I, I think, right, there's several different ways that they could go about that. And, and it would be worth talking to an attorney about what the most cost effective as well as the most enforceable might be. Perfect. Okay. Another from Nicole. As far as copyright expiring, if we have put the artwork and copyrights into a trust, does that negate the expiration date of the copyright? No. And in that regard as well, does artwork have an inherent copyright without registration? Yes. Artwork, uh, copyright exists the moment that you fix it in a tangible medium. So it's an original creative expression fixed in a tangible medium. It exists at the minute you do that. Um, uh, putting a copyright into a trust does not negate the the expiration date of the, the copyright. What it might do, though, right? So copyright is the life of the author plus 70 years. Um, it might be, it might qualify under the 120 years from creation if it was created for the trust. So that's another question that an attorney would be able to, to really work through with them on an individual basis. Perfect. Okay. Craig, Craig says, I'm having a friend design and create a new design logo for my business. Does this individual have the rights to use my creation or is the logo mine? <laughs> um, so, uh, okay. Again, we go back to the fundamental premise of intellectual property law. He or she who creates owns absent an agreement to the contrary. Um, if they, if your friend does not assign the logo to you, even if he created it on behalf of your business, even if you paid him, the premise is that, because work for hire is a very, very specific doctrine in copyright law, it does not apply to trademarks. So, um, right, it, it it behooves him to have an assignment of the, the logo to the business. 
I will tell you a story about that. And it was like one of the few times when um, intellectual property has impacted like other areas of law. It's one of the things that I love. Like you get to learn a little bit about everything. Um, if you're an intellectual property lawyer, like you get to dabble in bankruptcy. Sometimes you get to dabble. This was family law. Okay. So brother and sister inherit a business from the parents. Sister is married to brother-in-law. Brother-in-law creates the logo, the new logo for the business after the parents pass and the kids inherit the business. Well, fast forward a few years later, everybody's operating fine, but brother and brother-in-law and sister are starting to have some marital issues. They end up divorcing. What do you think the biggest bone of contention in that divorce was? That would be the logo. He wanted more of the business in the divorce because he created the logo, even though the business was owned by the brother and sister and he was not a co-owner, but he was able to hold them up because he never assigned the logo to the business. So again, if you have people who are creating anything for you in your business, you need to have assignments executed by them of that intellectual property to the business if you intend to keep using it. Thank you. Janine asks, artwork question, deceased father-in-law was an artist in Santa Fe. His name was trademarked, I think. He had uh, leaning tree cards, etc. What are all uh, the places we need to look to find his registrations? Can we or do we need to transfer copyright? Wow, that's a lot of questions in one, one answer. I will tell you, um, okay, so if you have the deceased father's name, you can look up the, the name either as an applicant or as an owner, or if it was actually trademarked as a name on the, and we're so creative at the US Patent and Trademark Office, on our trademark electronic search system, or TESS as we like to call it. Um, so you can look that up on tests. It's a relatively easy thing. You can just put in and it'll come up with anything that, that looks like that. Um, I would also search the U S copyright office. Um, they are finally digitized. I believe no pictures, but you can look up the name and find out if there's any copyright registrations associated with them. And just remember, copyright is handled by the U.S. Copyright Office. Trademarks are handled by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. They are, although they overlap in a lot of ways, they are two very distinct bodies of law, right? So, and they should not be confused. Um, so I would look in all of those places to see what's out there. And, and then also, you know, it might be worthwhile if the deceased father didn't have kind of a listing that went along with the business, um, or went along with his gallery or his his body of artwork, um, it might be difficult to track a lot of those things down. Um, and sometimes artists aren't that organized. So um, when it comes to thinking about what happens to them beyond their life. Um, okay, and then ma'am, you had a question. Oh, what what do you have to do to assign? It's a usually a simple agreement says I created this for you and they're, they're online or you can ask an attorney. Um, Victor, do you have a, a simple assignment document? Sorry to call on you. <laughs> right. It's like your car. Yeah. Way less involved than your house, but it's like transferring the deed to a car. Okay, Chris, any more questions online? Yes, two more. Okay. When I find others using my photos online for commercial purposes, do I have protection even if I haven't filed for a copyright on that photo? So that's an interesting question. Um, because the copyright exists um, when it's fixed in a tangible medium, um, technically, right, you have rights in that. And if you didn't license those rights um, to the person who's unit using it for commercial purposes, the answer is maybe, but you need to go get a copyright registration if you want to enforce it in the United States. And most interestingly, the U.S. Copyright Office actually has a small claim, basically a small claims court um, where people can represent themselves in front of the U.S. Copyright Office in order to get a small sum of monetary damages from people. But in situations where it doesn't warrant, you know, the million dollar case um, 
or the 74 million to bring Pharrell back into the conversation. I love the music world in the copyright sense. Um, but right, like it, the small claims court is really a fantastic um, avenue for people to do. Um, so uh, definitely check that out. And there's all kinds of tutorials. They have YouTube videos and everything like that. Um, and worst case scenario, if you can't find anybody, I know who to call at the U.S. Uh, Copyright Office um, to make sure that you get kind of all of those guidebooks and tutorials on the copyrights. Last question from online. Uh, can musicians freely perform a cover song but need to contact a copyright owner to record or publish that performance? So in the in the copyright world, there is something called a bundle of copyrights. And, and one of those bundles that is owned by the copyright owner is a performance right. So if you are doing cover songs, you should be contacting ASCAP or BMI and, and getting a license to um, enable you to perform those songs live. What happens um, when you contact the artist usually? Um, so a variety of things when you contact the artist um, can happen. Um, if you're Dolly Parton, who I absolutely adore in the copyright and music world, um, you know, she she reserves a lot of her songs for herself and for people, you know, you've, you've got to be pretty spectacular to record I Will Always Love You. I think the only two people who have are Whitney Houston and Miley Cyrus. And let's remember that Miley is Dolly's goddaughter. So, right, um, you know, if, if you have someone who's who's relatively um, sophisticated about their intellectual property and the copyrights, um, it, it might come with certain restrictions. One of my favorite examples is Zach Brown, wrote Chicken Fried. Um, there was another country band that wanted to record Chicken Fried, and Zach said, fine, record it, but you can't release it as a single. It can only go on your album. Well, sure enough, the record studio said, no, that's the single. And they released it as a single. And Zach sued, despite everybody in Nashville saying, your career's over now. You will never have a career um, after this. He sued. He won because as the copyright owner, you have the ability to grant permission to people um, about what they do with your ideas and what they do with your copyright. So, um, yes, if they're performing cover songs, and they're very faithful to it. That is definitely something that you contact ASCAP and BMI and you can do it. Um, same if you're going to use songs and presentations or quite frankly, even on a TikTok video, um, it might behoove you to have an ASCAP or BMI license to do that. Um, and, you know, they have all different kinds of pricing that that go on with ASCAP and BMI. You should be getting permission. You should not be violating somebody else's intellectual property. And if it is a song that's on the radio that becomes popular that you, you know, people will sing along to, you should presume that it's copyrighted um, and find out who the owner is and and ask for permission. There are a lot of people, though, that will just say, oh, yeah, go and do it. If, if all you're doing it is performing it live, but it behooves you to have that permission in some form or another. And it's easier with the music industry because they have ASCAP and BMI that basically collect um, so that you can have one-stop shopping in terms of, of getting permissions. Yes. Uh, the question was, is there a cost to the permission? And yes, usually there is. Usually. Um, so that's, oh, I have 10 minutes. Okay. And we haven't even touched patents. All right. So there are three types of patents. Um, there are plant patents. Those are, those protect asexually reproducing uh, plants. Don't ask me, you now have the sum total of knowledge of mine about plant patents. Um, I understand that they are very popular with horticulturists and they come in color, so they're kind of cool, but that's about all I know. Um, it is a very niche area of, of patent law. Um, I like to say that I think they win the king of the geeks context, uh, contest for us. Um, design patents protect the ornamental features of a device or of an article of manufacture. Um, I always like to talk about the overlap between design patents and trademarks at this point. So I think everybody knows that this is a pop socket, um, right? Colorado company, 
Um, they were having a lot of problems. They, in fact, testified in front of Congress about their problems um, selling pop sockets online. In fact, they pulled all of pop sockets from Amazon so they could say in their marketing, if you bought this off of Amazon, it's not a pop socket. Um, and uh, the CEO and I sat down for a little conversation at one point, and I just looked at him and said, well, why aren't you filing a 3D structural trademark? And he was like, wait, what's that? Um, and you can, right? So if you have something that's a design patent as you're building up um, some source identification, because remember I said a trademark can be anything as long as it identif identifies the source of goods and services, um, it can become a trademark. Coca-Cola did it with that bottle. Um, that started out as a design patent. For any of you who have dog, does anyone else in the room have a dog who's an aggressive chewer? Like I do? Okay, so Kong dog toys are my life. And that 3D shape of the snowman started out as a design patent and became a trademark because consumers associated that shape uniquely with Kong dog toy. Same with pop sockets. So they actually have a trademark registration for that right now. So, uh, and probably the most famous design patent on the planet is the Apple, the rounded edges of your, uh, the iPhone that was the subject of worldwide infringement litigation between Apple versus Samsung. Is that still ongoing? I never know. Bits and pieces. Yeah, it was a billion dollar lawsuit. Um, okay. Uh, so again, does anyone know who the unique shape of an electric guitar design patent is owned by? Uh-uh, uh-uh, yeah, no, 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 did Prince, it was Prince, yeah, it was Prince, and I keep telling the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because they have that guitar on display, I'm like, you need to put his design patent right next to it, anyway, um, so they last for 15 years from the date of filing, and then finally we get to utility patents, and this protects Utility patents are the form of intellectual property that protects the idea itself. Um, there was one person um, who prior to this asked me about trademarking a character. And most interestingly, you cannot actually trademark a character until it becomes a series. So if all JK Rowling had produced was book number one of Harry Potter, she would not have been able to get Harry Potter as a trademark registration. It was only once she published books two and three because it has to be serialized. But I think it just has to be two. I don't know that there's a case on that though. Um, so the question was how many does it need to be to be serialized? But I think it's definitely more than one. Um, we can, I, I'm a patent attorney. I love to argue about the meaning of words. So uh, <laughs> we can talk more about that later. Um, but inventions, right? It protects how something works, what it does, how it functions. It's all of the things that you think about when anybody talks about patents. Um, and one of the things that I hope you'll also take away from this is like intellectual property is much more vast than just patents. But when people talk about IP, it tends to devolve into just a patents discussion. Um, but IP is way more than that. Um, again, um, there's actually probably 30 to 40,000 patents that are associated with this device, right? So um, uh, you can have multiple patents that go in one product to a consumer. You can have patents that protect the thing that goes to the consumer, as well as patents on how something might work but you don't necessarily have a commercial embodiment of it. So when people come to me and they say, well, I've searched for this online, I, I haven't seen it at Lowe's or I haven't seen it you know, on online on one of the e-commerce marketplaces, that doesn't matter. If you're not doing a prior art search with the US Patent and Trademark Office um, and, and really looking at the body of patents that has come before, you can't tell me that it doesn't exist yet. Um, right. You really need to be doing that prior art search, especially if you're a small business, you're investing a lot of money in a patent. Um, you know, the general convention is that it costs in between eight thousand and fifteen thousand dollars to get a U.S. patent application on file. That's one that gets examined by a patent attorney or by a patent examiner. We'll talk about this in a second. Um, but it's a very expensive proposition. Right. We also have ways of bringing that 
expense down a little bit, but most of those fees are not paid to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Most of them go to a patent attorney who is skilled, right, in the art of and, and that technical field, but they're also very skilled at writing the patent applications. We have a lot of antiquated means of doing things. I mean, I don't think our claim structure has really changed since 1790, um, and and it, it it is an art. It's not a science. It is an art to draft appropriate claims that cover an invention. So it does behoove you. It is a best practice recommended by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to hire a patent attorney to write your patent applications for you. There are ways of getting a patent attorney to be matched with you for free. So James said something about Mikasa. Uh, Mikasa is a pro bono program run um, out of Mikasa Resource Center in Denver, Colorado, covers New Mexico, um, but they will match you with a patent attorney for free. There are also ways of accelerating the process. Getting a patent is not a one and done type of thing. Um, it is a process, usually takes anywhere from 18 months to three years. Um, you can accelerate that though through a variety of problems. So for the people in the room who are doing anything with climate or environmental, we are running a fast track program for free you actually can get your patent in less than a year under one of our fast track programs. We have something called track one where you pay a fee in order to get to the front of the line. Um, and then we also have um, a cancer moonshot program uh, and a first time filer. So if it is your first time filing a patent application, you can get a fast track application for free from the US Patent and Trademark Office right now. Um, it must be useful, it must be novel, and it must be non-obvious. So when I say useful, it means it can't be an excluded statutory subject matter. Um, it can't be something that can be done in a person's mind. It can't be a person. Um, it can't be something found in nature. It can't be abstract. Um, it has to be useful. Uh, novel means no one person can have done it before you. And non-obvious means given everything that comes before, is this an advancement? Is what you've created unique over everything that has come before? Um, which is a little daunting when I then tell you that like last fiscal year, there were over 643,000 patent applications that were filed and we issued the closest to about 400,000 patents that we ever have. I think it was 399,000 last year. Um, there is a lot of prior art and just because you don't see it on the marketplace does not mean it doesn't have a patent on it. Um, and before you spend the money on a patent attorney, it is a best practice that is recommended. You do a prior art search. If you need help doing that, it's like peeling back an onion. Um, that's the Shrek part of the talk for those in the room who like that show too. Um, but right, like it, it is not like you just don't go on Google because whatever you call a screw, I might call a removable fastener or a semi-permanent fastener. Patent attorneys get the ability to make up their own words. It's one of the reasons why I became a patent attorney. Um, but right, like, so we call things something different. And just because you do a natural language search on your favorite search engine um, that maybe will remain name it, nameless, that part of it is, right, like, it, you may not be finding the right prior art. So our Patent and Trademark Resource Centers, the one that's down in Las Cruces at NMSU, is amazing. They will help you do design your search. They won't do it for you. You got to do it. But they will help you kind of look at other places that you might not think of when you're doing a prior art search. Okay. So you guys will get a copy of the presentation because there's a whole bunch of other stuff in here that I did. There's our patent public search tool. Kathleen knows. She's like, I go through all the trouble of preparing these presentations for you. And you spend the entire talk on one slide. Um, this is great. Um, definitely do that. We have tutorials online about how um, to use that if you have questions. Um, there's all of our startup resources that are put in one place. I can highly recommend our assistance centers. Um, if you also have a question, though, and you just want a friendly face to talk to you, absolutely, you can reach out to my office, the Rocky Mountain office. You can reach out to the Texas office. Um, my colleague, Hope Shimabuku, is fantastic as, as well. So, um, and again, if you like this presentation, I'm Molly. If you didn't, I'm Hope and her, no, I'm kidding. Um, she hates when I do that. Um, we talked about patents a little bit. There are filing fees that go to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. We give small entities a discount. That means if you're less than 500 people in your organization, you get a discount. Um, that's 
of um, the, the regular uh, full fare fee. We also have a micro entity status. Um, you have to have an income not greater than three times the median income, um, which is also the qualifier for our pro bono program. Okay, track one, we talked about our pro se assistance uh, program. You can't go it yourself. Um, again, you're creating assets for your company. Um, I am a chemical engineer. Thank you, Hugh and M for that. Um, but I don't do my own plumbing, right? Um, because in my portfolio, my biggest asset is my house. Um, so I'm not about, to, I'm gonna hire a professional to do my plumbing. And so that is one of the reasons why a best practice is, is the um, recommendation that you hire an attorney. Okay, um, but we do have pro se assistance programs. There are people who at the agency who can help you uh, do things yourself. There we go. What was that? Oh, um, pro se is Latin for by yourself. Pro bono is for the good. Um, lawyers like Latin, which is probably good since I took five years of it in high school. Um, uh, additional resources, one of the biggest mistakes that startups make um, is uh, actually identifying the intellectual property that's in their business. Very quick example, I was talking with a small business person and we were going through some ideation about what might be in his business. And he imports coffee beans from another country, roasts them here. And I said, well, what's your business proposition? Why would I buy your coffee over the logo that I use every single day? Right. Um, <laughs> why, why would I do that? And he said, well, my roasting process is better. And he had never considered his roasting process as a trade secret that needed to be protected. Right. So most small businesses miss the intellectual property that is in their in their business and that probably needs protection because um, he came in to talk to me solely about trademarks and logos. Um, so anyway. I think that's one of the things. Those are all of the um, Patent and Trademark Resource Centers. Um, the librarian at Durango is probably the closest to y'all. Maybe, I don't know, maybe six to one, half dozen to the other for Crucis versus Durango. Um, but, you know, Durango has good skiing. Crucis doesn't. Um, it, oh, that was, see, that's the Lobo in me that I, I can't. I can't. Um, we also have a law school clinic program at UC Boulder um, or CU Boulder uh, that uh, this, I love these programs. It gives law students the ability to actually represent people and put something practical on their resume um, when they graduate from law school. And it also gives um, the community uh, good. They do all of their work under the supervision of a registered attorney though. Okay. Those are the resources in their area. Um, we did that. That's my office. It's in the Byron Rogers building. Um, and yes, that building is famous for another reason. Um, uh, anyway, so we'll go there. Um, that's the Texas regional office. I felt the need to put that there. And then uh, Patent and Trademark Resource Centers, pro bono program. Oh, wait, come on. Okay. that's. The number for pro bono. Randy is actually fantastic. Um, tell him I sent you. Um, our free services are here. Aventors Assistance Center. Law School Stop Fakes. Um, this is a great program by an alphabet soup of agencies, but mostly International Trade Administration that talks about, in particular, online commerce and um, infringing goods coming, counterfeit goods coming in. We talked about custom. Oh, 328. There we go. Okay, so you will have this um, presentation. Um, don't hesitate to use it. Don't hesitate to ask questions. And if you have nothing else um, or you learned nothing else, um, uh, please do recognize that you have someone at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office that you can call. So, yes, ma'am. So, Steffi, where are we going to get the copy of the presentation? What? Oh, yeah, that's the most helpful page. There we go. Yeah. It'll come through your email. For so. those of you online, you'll Steffi will email the presentation to you through the channel from which you were registered. And I was going to ask you, Molly, do you want to do two more questions? Do we have time? 
can I? Can we do? Okay, we'll do two more questions. Okay. Annie asked, if somebody else says it out loud, but I write it down, such as a quote or a wise remark, do I then own it because I created the tangible form? And what if a person who spoke it or created it passed away before it was published or used, and a seller wants to use it commercially, do they contact the surviving family? Wow. They have some great, I need to go back to teaching law school after um, so this seminar. Um, okay, so someone else said something and they didn't write it down or publish it, but you did. Mm. That feels wrong. Like, I'll just tell you the gut is wrong on that. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking through and I'm, yeah, it, it's, it's who would be the author. If you claimed it jointly, that might be okay. Um, but if you just take it, doesn't feel right. Um, so anyway. That's there, an excuse that. for not being witty, I guess. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, some of us, some of us aren't. Um, but um, for the record, nothing I've, you can have anything I said today. Um, I work for the government. It's, it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, so as to the second one, like, wow, that would get into some like estate law, intestate stuff. Maybe they have a will. You'd have to know a lot about that. Um, and depending on like how you learned of whatever it is that they said, um, like if it would, if you got it off of, and I'll just use an example, if, you know, you got to see an Elvis interview and you're, you know, you're not going to attribute the quote to Elvis, um, but it was in an interview. So that was recorded somewhere that might be a problem, right? We're, and, and the Elvis estate is pretty famous for going after people. So um, yeah, I, I would proceed with caution. Let's put it that way and consult an attorney. Perfect, thank you. The second question is from Craig. Regarding logo creation, I uploaded my picture to create my business card on Vistaprint. Is Craig okay? Oh, okay. Read the Vistaprint agreement. Um, I I haven't read it in its entirety. Um, but when you, uh, like there's a click through agreement, I don't, for some services like Facebook, you actually give a license to Facebook so that anybody else can share your photos that you post to Facebook. You also rep and warrant to Facebook that you own the copyright in whatever you post. So just for the record there, <laughs> um, in case you didn't read the click-through agreement when you signed up for Facebook as a user, um, I did, but that that's me. Um, but no, like I would go back to the agreement with Vistaprint. Um, you should be okay, right? Like they're, you're giving Vistaprint you like, or a printing service like that, usually just a limited license in order to create prints for you. Um, but I would go back to the agreement. Thank you, Molly. On behalf of all our online guests, we want to thank you for the presentation. Chris, you have a, a, such a great voice. I just have to say that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for all your help today. Awesome. All right. We're around for a little while, so feel free to ask more questions. Thank you, Molly, Beth, and Kathleen. Let's have a round of applause for our presenters. And Steffi, thank you so much. Um, some of you have expressed interest. Um, thank you, Zoom attendees as well. Uh, for those of you here in person, a few of you had asked for brief one-to-ones. Um, so we will be going to the university, uh, UNMLA. We have a conference room, conference room set aside. Um, these dear ladies have to drive back home or fly back or no, go back I, to the I airport, have right? Dinner at the shed tonight. Okay, so she has an so she's got an appointment. PM, we're done because yeah. we're heading down.